It was my first time going camping, and my family was taking us to a forest in Southern California. They thought it was about time for a proper family vacation. We arrived around three in the afternoon when the sun was still high. We went for a hike deep in the woods, until we found a spot far enough from civilization as there was another nearby campground. We found a good spot when the sun began to set. My uncle sends me with my six-year-old niece at one point, to go find some firewood. We go together, all the while I'm trying to tell my niece as many forest facts as possible, as she always wants to learn something new, and she looked up to me. We take our time, and come back about twenty minutes later. It's around 9 p.m. now. Almost all the young ones and parents were asleep. So me, a friend who was our guest, and our cousins as well as my uncle were up. The fire was slowly fading, and I went to go find more firewood. My friend asked if he wanted me to join him. I said no, not to worry about it, that I would be back in no time. But I would soon regret that answer. I walk a few minutes into the woods. I know that I need to hurry as I can hear my uncle and my friend talking. Yet, I can no longer see the fire. I pick up some kindling, and I start to head back. Though, I am having trouble finding my way. As I'm beginning to panic, I stop, and begin to look around. That's when I hear the sound of a twig snapping. My heart seems to freeze. Hello? I call out. When another snap occurs even closer, I panic more, forcing myself to run. But I stop again realizing, I have no sense of direction anymore. I have no idea where to go where the camp is. And now those ominous footsteps are closing in on me. Footsteps that are far too deliberate and heavy. I gather my courage, and I shout for my family, not caring if my pursuer hears me. This also confirms that whoever's following me, it's not someone I know, because they don't reply to my calls. I stumble around for about five more minutes, all the while the footsteps are still coming. I don't see any signs, nothing familiar. I continue walking, hoping for something. That's when I come across a river. It seemed to be heading down. Remembering that we were near a body of water, that I believe broke off into a river, I began to run up to it. I'm desperate, once again searching for anything familiar, but failing. I had been focused on setting up the tents after all. A noise behind me catches my attention. I turn, to finally see my pursuer. There's a silhouette, tall and skinny, and for a moment I believe that it's my friend, as it somewhat resembles his shape, but this assumption was wrong. I took a step closer to the man, still trying to get a word out of him, but all he did was stay still. It didn't take long for my eyes to adapt to the darkness and I soon made out details. There was a massive scar over both his eyes, his clothes were torn up and dirty. When I saw that he had something sharp and glinting in his hand, I ran. I go back up the hill, hoping that I'm close to the campsite, close to anyone that could hear me. Eventually, I do find myself in the middle of the trail that showed that the other campsite was close. I ran in that direction. Suddenly seeing what appeared to be two families, a total of eight people, looking for me, flashlights lacing the forest. I was found, and reunited with my friends and family. I immediately told them the story of the man with the torn clothes and the scarred eyes. I had been lost for over two hours, and I was nearly attacked. This event did not stop me from camping in the future, but it did keep me from wandering into the woods, where there were no trails or landmarks. I love camping and hiking. I'm a 40-year-old male, and my story takes place a couple of years ago. I'm someone who is highly well-versed in camping and hiking, and so the following story is the only time I've ever found myself lost in my entire life you will understand the circumstances as to how I wound up lost soon enough, and just how strange they were. 
there are plenty of places to hike and camp in Northern California. Despite what tourist ads would have you believe, there is still plenty of woods and nature in California. The ads are generally catered to SoCal, and not we in the North, but that's another story entirely. Anyway, I had a week off work for vacation, and I wanted to spend those doing my favorite thing, hiking and exploring our great woods in this lovely state. I got my things together and left super early to a campground about 100 miles from where I left. I am familiar with the area, and the moment I got there, I got my stuff and began my hike. I started my job on many hiking trails, knowing this particular trail led into the woods. Quite often, I'd then break from the path, and I had a nice little area off the beaten path that I was very familiar with. This area tended to have far fewer hikers and campers, and while not necessarily on the main pass, there was no rule that said I had to stay on the beaten path. When the opportunity arose, I broke from the path, having purposely waited till no one was around as it's much more exciting to be alone in the woods, and I honestly didn't want my hidden secret to be exposed by random passerbys. I was quite sure my path had been trotted by those better versed within the area, but there's a certain pride to those of us who hike and camp often to take in blazing our own trails and finding our own secrets within the woods at hiking trails. Now, this is where things began to take a turn for the strange. I have walked this area quite often, and I always make a point to camp out once I get deep enough that I'm sure I'm away from the trails. I plan to spend at least a good three to four days of my vacation out here camping, so I brought plenty of supplies. Once I arrived at the spot I usually camped, I stopped and set up my tent and got some food and water in me. I always prepare in case something goes wrong and so I had more than enough food and water to survive a couple of weeks at least, to be safe. The night was peaceful, and I fell asleep fast to the sound of nature all around me. There is nothing more relaxing than the feeling of being alone in nature. I awoke the next morning, packed my gear up and had some breakfast and continued my hike. It was while I was hiking that I soon heard something I wasn't accustomed to hearing out in the middle of nowhere. I heard trying. The crying appeared to be coming from just up ahead, along the path, but slightly to the right of it. I soon came upon a blue-haired woman in yoga pants and a tank top crying on the side of the path. I announced myself as she stopped crying, but kept her hands over her face. I asked if she was okay. The woman claimed she was lost and wasn't sure how to get back. I felt for her, and reached a hand out to help her, but as I touched her, she jumped back. The woman? She, she felt ice cold. Still covering her face, she began to cry again. In an attempt to calm the woman, I smiled and assured her it was okay. I explained that she needed to only walk straight back the way I came and that she would be found easily. I told her she'd eventually reach the main trails and could get back on those and head back to her Vilcor home. The woman stopped crying and asked if I was sure. I reassured her with a smile, but she wouldn't bring her hands down from her face. Concerned, I asked if she needed me to go with her, but she said no, she would find her way. She told me thank you, but she still wouldn't show me her face, as she ran straight back the way I'd come. I could have called someone to help her, but where I was, I, I don't know, I just didn't know if I would get any reception there. I debated following her, but... She had refused my help and I was worried if I followed her that she might think I was dangerous and it might spook her off the path or get me in trouble when I finally made my way back. So, in order to avoid any misunderstandings, I told myself I tried to help the woman by pointing her to the correct area. After a few more hours, I had calmed a bit and thought to myself, I'm sure the woman found her way and before I knew it, I was ready to stop again. I decided to set up camp in an area that looked as though someone had previously camped there. It still had the indentation of a tent, but it was clear whoever had been there had cleaned up and left a while ago. Part of me wondered if it had been the woman that I had come across, or another adventuring soul like myself. I soon set up, ate some dinner and settled in for the night. 
I was awoken in the early hours of the morning to the sound of familiar crying. At first, I thought it couldn't be, but, checking my watch, I noticed it was 3 in the morning. I pulled out my flashlight. At first, I followed the sobs. A little way up the trail I was shocked to see the same blue-haired woman, hands covering her face, crying. I announced myself once again and asked the young woman if she had gotten turned around somehow. She stopped crying and told me she wasn't sure. I specifically remember her saying, it never ends. Perplexed, I tried to calm her by asking if I could offer her some food. I explained to her my camp wasn't too far away and I had more than enough food to spare if she wanted some. The woman asked if I would be so kind to point her home. I told her I wasn't sure what she meant by home, but the nearest main trail was many hours away in the opposite direction. I told her she must be hungry, and if she would just come back with me, I could offer her some food. I made sure not to press past this, however, as again, I didn't want any misunderstandings. The woman simply shook her head no, and then she'd find her way before heading back the way of my camp. I followed behind and asked if she wanted me to at least walk her back to my camp. She didn't say anything. She just continued walking with her hands over her face, and her fingers open just enough to see ahead of her. We eventually made it back to my camp when I told her she could sleep in my tent if she wanted to, and I'd stay outside and in the morning I'd help her find a way back. The woman entered my tent, hesitantly, and I laid out looking at the stars till I passed out. In the morning I checked my wash to see that it was nine on the dot. I got up, stretched, and then proceeded to announce myself before slowly opening my tent. I found no one inside my tent. At first I was thrown off, but eventually I realized she probably left and didn't want to disturb me, or she waited till I fell asleep and maybe left being she didn't really know me. I made a big breakfast that morning, and figuring there wasn't much I could do, I packed up and decided I'd head back. It was when packing up there I realized the strangeness of my situation. I hadn't paid it any mind the previous night because in the dark, I had noticed it. That said, at the first camping spot I usually park it, there is a very distinct tree with a carving of a heart and the initials E and L in it. This tree has a very distinct shape as well, as the way the branches go out it makes it look like a horse is on two legs and jumping back. It's the best way I can describe it. It was only now, in broad daylight, that I noticed these things. I am positive that I had walked for hours in a straight line toward my next camping spot. I hadn't made any weird turns or wandered off where I normally would be. Now, if my eyes were to be believed, I had somehow looped back to my camping spot. I was thrown enough by this that I decided to head back the way I'd come in the hopes of hitting the main trail again. Well, minutes turned to hours before I knew it and he did a stop. I found the nearest clearing and decided to set up my camp. Had I caught and turned around somehow? That was something that rang in my head, but I was in disbelief as I knew there was no way I'd be turned around. I was about to set things up and make some dinner where I heard the sound of crying once more. It was just up ahead, and on my way back, I slowly and cautiously walked toward the sound of crying, and there I found the woman crying hands covering her face, next to a tree. The moment I came into the open, I noticed she stopped crying. I shakily said, H hello? And I asked if I could help her. I told her I felt a little lost myself, but this was the third time our paths had crossed and I wanted to be sure we both found our way home. So, she, if she'd give me a minute, we could go back to my campsite and get things packed up and head toward the main trail. The woman nodded but refused to bring her hands down from her face. I didn't press her as to why, and she followed me back to my camp. I grabbed some jerky and offered her some, but she simply shook her head. So I packed up my camp and walked with her. I tried to go back toward where I believed the main path should be. I spent the rest of the night walking and every now and again I tried to ask her questions about what she was doing out here and where she was from. Eventually I gave up on that and tried small chat. She never responded. It was as the sun was coming up, and we had been walking in silence for hours, that I noticed the main trail was finally in sight. I smiled and felt relief, and told the woman see, it was okay. 
I heard her say thank you, and when I turned back to tell her you're welcome, to my shock, no one was there. I started my hike on a Friday and when I arrived back home on a Sunday afternoon, I was happy knowing I could spend the rest of my vacation at home. I never found out who that woman was or where she went. The rational part of my mind was that she said thank you and then just left, but it doesn't make sense. I would have heard her leave, right? I also can't explain how I looped back to that same spot when I was first hiking. I don't do drugs and I wasn't on any sort of medication. I'm very well versed in hiking and camping, and I was quite familiar with the location I was hiking. Even if I hadn't been, I went straight the entire time. I still hike and camp today. I have never had a run-in like that again, and I've been back to that same area and hiking path since. I've never seen the woman, heard any crying, and I've never looped again. This is easily the strangest experience of my life, and I thank you for allowing me to share it. I'm in my mid-twenties and was 19 at the time of this story. I live on the border of Ohio and West Virginia in a vastly wooded area in the same house I've lived in for as long as I could remember. At the time I had quite a few young friends that I spent every weekend with. That particular autumn night, we were at my friend Jonah's house, sitting outside in front of his house at a campfire. We were laughing, drinking, just having a good time. No one wanted the night to end, so when the fire began to go out, Jonas stood up and declared that he was going to get more firewood. So he left the group. The night went on, minutes passed, and Jonah did not return. I began to get nervous. He had been gone for 15 minutes, and the pile of firewood was only just behind the house. Maybe he needed some help carrying it, I thought. So I stood and started towards the back of the house. The firewood pile was at the edge of the forest there, and that's where I found Jonah. He was stiff and shaking, pale as a ghost and eyes wide, staring into the forest. I patted him on the shoulder and asked what was wrong. He barely moved, but slowly brought a quivering arm up, and he pointed. I followed his finger and peered into the trees. A pair of huge white and circular eyes peered back. The eyes were only a few feet off the ground, so whatever the creature was, it was either short or crouching. Me and Jonas stood there watching it for a while, too scared to move or even breathe. And then the creature stood. It wore a plaid red shirt and blue jeans. It was at least nine feet tall and skinny beyond belief. It had no nose or ears or hair, but huge shimmering eyes and a skeletal mouth. Jonah and I bolted. We ran into the forest and soon lost sight of each other. I didn't care. All I knew was that I ran in the opposite direction of the thing. I soon heard footsteps running in the bushes behind me. They were too fast to be Jonah and sounded like they were on all fours. They were closing in. I turned around while still running, but wished I hadn't. I saw its glimmering eyes focusing on me. And then I fell into a hole. I fell about five feet and into the dirt. It looked like a trap. I suddenly heard the sound of a ringing bell, like some sort of alarm, followed by voices. They were freezes like, I think we got it. They were local hunters, apparently. Not taking the chance, though, I began to climb out of the hole as quickly as possible. I couldn't see the hunters, nor the creature from before. As I scanned in every direction, I realized I was utterly and hopelessly lost. I almost gave up, but then decided that if the hunters were out here, then there must be civilization nearby. After an hour of what seemed like endless searching, I found something an empty cabin. It was unlocked and I let myself inside. I don't remember if I fainted or just collapsed from exhaustion, but I woke up some time later to the sound of a piercing scream. Not sure what it was, I decided to hide under the bed nearby. Some time later I heard someone walking around the cabin, as if they were trying to find a way inside, 
I had locked the door, thank God. I thought I could wait until morning or until help arrived, but then I remembered the window. It was wide open, and the footsteps were getting closer to that side of the cabin. I had an idea. I crawled out from under the bed and I opened the door. The footsteps stopped for a moment, before doubling in speed and coming towards me. I ran to the back of the cabin to where the window was. I jumped out of the window as silently as I could, and I ran back into the forest. I glanced behind me, and barely saw the all-too-tall silhouette of something standing in the window, watching me as I tried to escape. Its head was tilted, and there was fresh red liquid on its mouth. I eventually found my way back to my house, not Jonah's. I traveled eight miles that night. Me and my remaining friends who I've told this story to refer to the creature as the Bubba Jacks. There's no reasoning behind it, besides it sounding creepy. The next time you're out in the woods, be careful, because you could get lost, and you could be stalked by the Bubba Jacks. Before I start this story, I should probably give you a little description of the place and myself. The area where this took place was out in a small farming village. There are basically sections of woods and farmland. On this occasion, the section of woods I was in had three defined barriers. To the north was an old railroad track. On the south and west was an open farmer's field. The east basically led to a denser block of trees. He'd eventually come to a road about a mile away, if he didn't get lost. As for myself, while I wasn't a hunter, I always had a good sense of direction. Even when I couldn't see the sun or had any other guidelines, I was extremely comfortable with being alone in the woods, and not afraid of going to hike in the dark. I found it peaceful, actually. I still do, but I'm more observant now, if that makes any sense. I also don't scare easily and I don't go into a panic too often. Funnily, I am also somewhat observant to the spiritual world, having seen and felt entities before this. So, to begin my story, the day started like any other day on a winter afternoon. I thought that I would go out to explore some patches of woods that I mentioned before. I always found it intimidating, but being a young kid and having explored everything in the area, this was to be one of the new places I would map out. So, I set out with bare minimum gear, really just an extra set of gloves and my favorite hiking stick. I knew there were still a few hours of daylight left, and I figured this wouldn't take too long, so I didn't think I would need too much more than that. When I first entered the patch of woods, everything was still and noisy. I could hear squirrels, birds, and the wind in the trees. Seeing as it was my first time, I stuck close to the border walking along the length of the field. Eventually, I came to the southern border and noticed a few interesting rock piles and I went to investigate. That's where I made my first mistake. Was not going back the way I came. I was in my explorer mode at this point and wanted to see everything, so I decided to go back through the heart of this wood. As I got farther into the heart of the woods, I noticed that several things were starting to become off. All the noises seemingly died down. At the time, I rationalized that as I was the predator, so all the animals quieted down for me. Now, I'm not so sure. The other odd thing was that I had some sense that I was being watched. It felt like from a distance, though. The final thing was that I noticed when I tried to backtrack Going back was harder than going forward, almost as if I was being a let somewhere. I checked my internal compass, as I don't get lost and haven't except for that time, which indicated the direction I was going was north, and strongly north of that. As I was walking along, I could still feel the gaze of this thing, but it seemed closer now. Looking behind me revealed only trees. I continued on despite the fact that the area I was in didn't look like the area close to the railroad tracks. What I didn't know was that I was heading towards the deep patch of woods where it would be difficult to find someone. Suddenly, 
I felt the thing move closer still. There was no noise, and I tried to say it was all in my head, or a hunter was messing with me. But what didn't help was the fact that whatever this thing was, I was either so silent I couldn't hear it, or it wasn't something physical. I could feel this thing increase its pace. At this point, the trees up ahead thinned out and I came into a field. It took me a few minutes to realize where I was and quickly made an adjustment to my course. I felt the thing again increase to my speed, narrowing down the gap between it and myself. I lunged deep into the railroad tracks, the northern border, and all the sounds came back. I could hear wildlife again, kids screaming at a nearby pond, and farther off I could hear vehicles. However, I still felt the eyes glaring daggers at me, just out of sight in the denser woods. It felt evil, the nasty energy radiated off whatever it was, but it would not show itself, nor did it step foot into the railroad tracks. All on my way home, I still felt it following on inside of the woods, till I came to civilization, and it seemed to turn and leave. As to say what it was, I cannot say. I have experienced a similar feeling two places since then. Once at a cemetery, and the last at an asylum in Ohio. I hesitate to say it was a physical creature, as I never saw or really heard anything, but I did feel it. Looking back now, I'm wondering if it was possibly something that thought I was up to no good on its turf, and maybe it was purposely trying to scare me off, but why chase me deeper into the woods? I haven't been back to that area since and I don't plan on going back anytime soon. I've lived in Alabama much of my life, and if you know anything about Alabama, it is that there are woods everywhere. Much of my days and nights of my youth were enjoyed wandering around near aimlessly playing war, tag, hide and seek, and other games. There are a few feelings as great as spending your days in the woods. The best time, in my opinion, was during the summer. You're out of school and just hanging with all your cousins and family while the adults usually locked you out of the house until evening, when they would just holler at you from the home, wash up, and get ready to go for dinner. As an adult, I roam the woods mostly during hunting season, and while it's always a good and freeing time away from work and stress of the everyday grind, there will never be anything quite like those summers in the woods. Well, the exception being summer of 2003. I was 14 at the time, and summer vacation was nearing its end. On the day in question, we had a big family get-together. The occasion wasn't anything specific or special. It was just a good time hanging with the family. It's just something that families do quite often out here in the country. Anyway, it was me, my cousins, who we will call Darnell, Dennis, Jim, Katie, and Leanne. We got up really early and all got together. At about 8 or 9 in the morning, the adults told us it was time to go out and play. When I was younger, I laughed at this because the adults would stay inside in an ice AC while we hung out in the elements. Mind you, we always have water on hand and lemonade among other things, but as an adult and a father not myself, I understand it. I look back on those days as some of the best times of my youth, and I'm grateful to my family for giving us that sort of freedom. Anyway, we started the day playing some football in the yard and throwing sticks to our grandparents' dog, Wendy. She was a golden retriever and was fairly large at that. Now. The first odd thing of that morning was Wendy herself. We had been outside for maybe an hour or so, not entirely sure because we didn't really keep track of time, until we were called up for dinner. When we decided it was time to go explore the woods, Wendy would always come with us and she usually be following one or more of us. This time, however, she stopped at the edge of the woods. She just stared, and when we tried to prod her along, she just refused to go any further. She would growl and eventually she whimpered and went back onto the back porch to relax in the shade. I know what you're thinking. We probably should have taken this as a sign and stayed in the yard that day. You are right. We probably should have done just that. 
Still, as a group of teenagers, we found this exciting and it only heightened the idea of fun in the woods. Also, while it was strange and out of place, it wasn't something I felt I needed to worry about too much as we usually carried knives and such for protection. So the day was going well, and one odd occurrence aside and after exploring the woods for a bit, we decided to play some hide and seek. We did this for a few rounds before it was my turn to seek. I closed my eyes and counted to 100. Yeah, we were pretty extreme about our count as we wanted a real amount of time to be able to hide. I finally finished counting, when I noticed someone appears to be trying to hide in some bushes in the distance. I laugh and start mocking them, and saying things like, Where are you guys? How will I ever find you? Then I get to the bushes in question, and laughingly tell whoever's in the bushes to come out, as I had spotted them immediately. I stand there quietly for a bit and finally I start kicking around impatiently in the bushes themselves. No response. I then grab a nearby small branch break the edges off and start poking around. I start to get a little annoyed and say whichever one of you is in these bushes needs to come out. I tell them I saw them, and they can't cheat. That's when I realize there isn't anyone there. So, coming down for a bit, I think I may have just been seeing things or maybe it was an animal I mistook for one of my cousins. I look up and see some rustling a bit all a ways ahead of me. I think great, I'll catch one of my cousins trying to switch spots. I rush forward and into the area with a lot of plant life. I'm talking larger plant life. The plants were roughly knee height and I'm no longer seeing anyone. After searching for a bit longer I begin to feel myself getting a little annoyed. I think to myself, I swear something was there. A few moments go by when I hear a light snickering that sounded like my cousin Katie from deeper in the woods. I start to cheer up a bit and run deeper into the woods figuring they are all just messing with me. Think to myself, it's alright, I'll just play law. I then continue to follow the snickering further. It is at this point I realize I'm not familiar with the area I'm in. I can still hear the snickering, which now goes into full-on laughter. It is now that I am positive it's Katie. So, a smile on my face and a newfound confidence within, I press forward. It isn't until walking for some time that I begin to realize the laughter is keeping maintaining a specific distance from me. At first I think it's just Katie running or something, but, the thing is, I haven't seen anyone moving forward or any leaves rustling. I've only continuously heard this laugh and followed the sound. I felt this was strange, and I was beginning to grow tired from following what I believed was Katie. Being in an unfamiliar area of the woods, I finally gave up and said, All right, Katie, I know it's you, you can come out now, you win, I can't find you. I listened closely, and the laughter stopped. I don't hear anything outside of the birds chirping. Huh, that's strange, I think to myself. I decided to continue a bit further in the direction I had originally heard the laughter coming from, but I found no one. The only sign of life was nature. After a few more minutes of searching, I give up. Deciding that Katie probably knew where she was going, even if I didn't, and she probably headed back by now. It is as I am walking around that I heard a loud shriek and I bolt in the direction of the sound, scared my cousin might be in trouble. I reach a clearing and realize no one is there. I'm starting to feel fear creep up on me. I am looking around and and I notice I'm not familiar at all with where I'm at. My family has a property line that they clearly mark and always tell us to never go beyond, and it's at this point I'm beginning to think I may have ignored the usual boundary line in my haste to find Katie. It isn't like it is marked off by a fence as the woods are way too deep. There are usually posts with yellow tape on them, and often the private property signs. Confused I looked around some more, as I look around, my blood begins to run cold as behind me I hear the most disturbing thing I have ever heard in my entire life. The best way I can describe it, and it won't do justice by the way, is a blood-curdling scream. I don't mean like a normal one either. I mean, it sounded like a mix of a woman and something demonic screaming. I'm not saying it was a demon. 
I'm saying the best way I could describe it was a mix between a grown woman and a demon if they screamed at the same time. This voice, or whatever it was, sounded like someone was being murdered or about to do something horrific and murderous to someone else. I freaked out and bolted forward. As I did this I could hear the scream again. It was louder this time and it followed me. My heart was racing, and I was beginning to feel lightheaded as I'm heavier set and not very good at sprints or marathons. Still, the adrenaline is me is saying to keep running and don't stop, and so I do just that for as long as I can. I reach another clearing and realize I'm completely lost at this point. But, I'm too scared to stop, so I lightly jog and half walk forward. I think to myself that I'm going to die out here if I don't keep moving. And so, no matter what, I refuse to completely stop. I look behind me every now and again and as I'm walking and trying to catch my breath. It is a few minutes later that I think I'm safe, and I finally stop. I start thinking to myself, Great, I'm lost. It's hot and I don't have any water on hand. I'm sweating, I'm lost, and the sun is beginning to lower in the sky. It isn't dark yet. During the summer, it takes a bit longer to get dark, but I realize it probably won't be long before my family will be calling us in for dinner. It isn't till later, I realize how much time I was out here running for. But now, I'm lost and have no idea where I am. So, not sure where to go, I figure I'll keep walking forward as I'll likely eventually hit a dirt road and maybe regain my bearings from there. The woods aren't going to go on forever, I tell myself, to try to keep myself calm. I stop to breathe for a second and it isn't long before I heard that shrill, terrifying scream again. It's behind me and it sounds fair the close. Freaked out and not even thinking a boat for, and at this point I'm crying, as I run. I can't hold my tears in or pretend not to be afraid anymore. I'm scared out of my freaking mind and just rushing through the trees and bushes as fast as I can, with branches slapping my face. I don't care what is ahead, as long as whatever is behind me doesn't catch up. I run for what feels like hours but I'm sure it was only maybe a half hour at most. I hear movement, and I feel like my heart is about to explode as I hear another scream and I force myself forward again. Terrified, I keep running until I suddenly reach a drop-off. It isn't very high, but it appears to be a small hill that is steep enough that if I fall face first, I might bounce and hit the bottom and break my neck. At first, I scramble up, so quickly that I fall down again. Then I stand up more slowly, unable to really run anymore or barely stand. It is now I realize the small hill I fell down from dropped me into a ditch, but the world before me is no longer wooded. I mean, there are woods ahead if I go up another embankment, but between that and the ditch, I'm in is a dirt road. I've never in my entire life been so happy to see a dirt road or any sign of civilization. I climb out of the ditch and sit for a second on the side of the road. I don't see anyone following me, and no one is driving on the road at the moment. Once I've had a few moments to relax, I look around and get my bearings again. I walk down the road to lay at a gas station I recognize. I go in and buy myself some water. It is after that that I head back home. I get home late and my family is standing around looking concerned. I explain to them I missed the boundary and accidentally wandered off our property line and after a big hug, I was in for a bit of a scolding. I told my family everything. I knew I'd sound crazy but I told them anyway. They thought maybe I had a bit of a breakdown when I realized I was lost and maybe I'd imagined things. But that scream was too real and whatever was out there lured me out into an unfamiliar part of the woods. I'm not sure what it was or who it was or why, but I'm grateful it never caught up to me. We were restricted to the yard for the rest of the summer, but we did eventually go out to the woods again. I was scraped up and needed to be rehydrated and stuff, but I was okay. Still, I'll never forget that summer. And I'll never forget that day. My story isn't a long one, but it occurred when I was 21. I went camping with my dad, and this was going to be the final time we went camping before I went off to college again. We live in Virginia, and it's a beautiful state. The events that led to this story were normal enough. 
We went camping like we always had, and we even went to the same area to camp. It was around the third night that things get weird. My dad and I are always packing, as you never know who or what you may run into while camping out in the woods. Most of the time, you have nothing to fear, but it's better to be safe than sorry when it comes to protection out in the middle of nowhere. I'd fallen asleep rather quickly on the third night when my dad awoke me up and told me to have my gun on me. My dad wasn't spooked easily, so I knew something was up. I came out of my tent, rifle in hand, and sat there, listening with my dad to the sound of loud snarling. This didn't sound like any animal we'd ever heard, though, and it wasn't long before we saw something huge on the edge of the tree line. It was a massive shadow that was at least 10 feet tall and it had red eyes. I've never seen anything like this, and the second it moved forward my dad and I fired our rifles. My dad hit this thing square between the eyes and I fired off around to its chest. But it kept walking forward. Freaked out, we abandoned camp and ran. It didn't take us long to get turned around as we didn't pay much mind to where we were running at that moment. After what felt like an eternity, we stopped to catch our breath. We stuck close to another as we heard someone speak from far away. This thing had my dad's voice. The very plain problem with that is my dad is right next to me, and this voice was coming from further away. It wasn't more than another minute when we saw the figure again. We fired off a few more rounds, and I'm sure we hit it several times. It didn't stop moving and so we continued running. We only stopped long enough to catch our breath and even then we made a point to keep walking and moving. We continued doing this until morning came. At that point we were completely lost and figured we'd take some time to rest after all that. We tried to find our way again. It wasn't long before we crashed. We awoke in the evening to the sound of large trees shifting. Freaked out, we jumped up and continued we kept running through the woods, like madmen. There are few things as scary as being lost in the woods, but being pursued by something you've shot several times is something I'd say is scarier. By the time night fell, we made the decision that we shouldn't sleep unless we absolutely need to. If that were the case, we would take sleeps and shifts. That never happened though, as this thing was soon upon us again. Strangely this time, it spoke in my mother's voice. The problem being, my mom had passed away three years prior in a car accident. I remember being sad and angry as we continued running. All through the night, no matter how fast we ran or how far we went, the moment we stopped this thing was there. It was by the next morning that we were able to rest once again. It was around now we realized this thing didn't seem to appear during the day. We took a couple of hours to get some rest and decided we would do all we could to get out of these woods before dark. We spent much of that afternoon just pressing forward and praying to see civilization again. We did eventually find our way out and spent the night in a motel that night. The next day, we would make the walk back to our truck and left. I'm not sure what that thing was, and to this day, I pray I never find the answer to that question. I have never gone camping since. About three years ago, I struggled severely with depression and suicidal thoughts. Those thoughts later manifested into plots. I stay up at night thinking about how I want to go out of this world. I thought about pills, slitting my wrist, all the cliche stuff you see in the movies. Although, I eventually decided upon a slow bleed method. I constructed a plan to make a two-hour drive from my house to the Inyo National Forest after work on a Friday and get lost. The plan was simple and stupid. I tried to survive as long as possible until something killed me, be it dehydration or fatigue or whatever else nature had to throw my way. I ordered some survival essentials on Amazon, packed a bag, and left as planned. I don't know what made this slow bleed idea so seductive, but my mind was set to it. 
I had no idea where I was going, but that drive felt like I was 10 again and on my way to Disneyland with my parents for the first time. I felt so overjoyed and relieved. I got there, parked my car behind some bushes and started walking. It was about 5 o'clock and the sun was falling quickly. Bad planning on my part, so I started running, deeper and deeper into the forest. I would run, then tire, so I'd walk a while, then run again, and I repeated this process for about three hours. I stopped at a clearing in the trees. It was around a little patch of mostly dead grass and leaves. I pitched my tent, unrolled my sleeping bag, and fell asleep, happy as can be. The next morning was far less tranquil, however. I woke up feeling like I had a terrible hangover, and I had no idea where I was or how I'd gotten there for at least five minutes. I began breathing rapidly and started jogging in random directions trying to retrace my steps. I ended up getting even more lost and separating myself from my gear and tent. I tried telling myself that this is what I wanted, but for some reason, I knew it wasn't anymore. I remember repeating no choice over and over again. That was a really cold night. I tried doing push-ups to keep me warm, but that hardly lasted. I tried singing Vienna by Billy Joel, but it was too cold and my teeth kept chattering. Although the cold was nothing compared to the fear, every falling leaf or trickling sound of the stream was a vicious predator in my mind. There was a point where I couldn't tell whether I was shaking from fear or the cold or a mixture of both. Finally, the morning came and I slept through most of the day in the ground, my back to a fallen tree stump. I woke at around 3 p.m. and once again I panicked. I began jogging in a seemingly random direction once again until I hit the road I came on. That feeling of relief was something I would never be able to explain. It humbled me, yet lit to be up. I walked up the road into a very nice old man in a big black truck pulled over to see if I needed help. I told him I was hiking and get lost. He drove me up the road to my car and I drove home. That weekend changed everything for me. I have never had a suicidal thought again, and I got the help I needed to do with my depression. This isn't very much of a survival story, but the whole experience changed my point of view on life and self-worth. I'm still working on constructing a suitable life for myself, but whenever I'm discouraged or I want to quit, I think back to that night in the forest, and after a quick shudder I realize just how much life means to me. It was a stupid plan, but I'm glad it was. I may not have survived a slightly more elaborate one. The Tori at Yoskuni Shrine of Tokyo was made from the highest quality of false cypress from Taiwan, but there's a dark history behind it. My great-great-grandpa's family was very poor. When he was 16, he quit school and became a logger to help with his family's financial hardships. It was the 1920s when the Japanese discovered a whole mountain of ancient false cypress in central Taiwan and decided to start harvesting it to build Shinto shrines. The indigenous tribe was very mad about the proposal. They warned that these trees were thousands of years old. They were so old to a point that they had developed consciousness as if they were conscious beings. There were also spirits guarding these ancient trees. Terrible revenge would ensue if these trees were harmed. That's what the Taiwanese said, what they believed. The Japanese officials ignored their protests and called them superstitious. They relocated the entire tribe so they wouldn't intervene in the operation. The operation began two days after my great-great-grandpa's 17th birthday. My great-great-granddad and his colleagues spent the entire day cutting only one-third of a tree in the first day, largely due to how big and tall these trees were. The first day of the operation was a success. Everyone was drinking happily with one another, and they were making fun of this warning from the indigenous peoples. The loggers camped right beside the logging yard, which is surrounded by these ancient false cypress. 
My great-great-granddad had a weird dream at the first night camping there. A dream that he was lost in these woods, panicking, trying to find his way out. He woke up in a cold sweat to his colleague's loud snoring. He shrugged it off, but he kept having the same dream every night. Dreams of being lost, with no way out. He was lacking sleep, and became so tired in the morning, he was not able to do work. So his boss transferred him to an office in Camp Yama, at the lower part of the mountain. He would be doing some light labor, like cooking and delivering documents. Days passed, with more and more trees being chopped down. Many loggers started developing inexplicable sicknesses, to which the doctors could not explain upon examination. Some of them had long-lasting fever, and some of them couldn't stop coughing. Some loggers even began quitting the job. They reported having nightmares, where they were lost in the woods, their names being called by demonic voices at night. One day after lunch break, a logger, covered in red, screamed and ran into the office at Camp Yama. Help! He yelled out, and collapsed right by the entrance, red gushing from a cut in his chest. It seemed to be from some sort of vicious animal attack. My granddad and some police officers immediately picked up their rifles, and rushed to the logging site as fast as possible. What my granddad saw traumatized him, for the rest of his life. There were more people, screaming, red all over the ground. It seemed like they had attacked each other. But for what, my granddad thought. They were hysterical, those that were still alive. It was like they were possessed. Some of them calling around and making weird noises like they were animals. A younger locker, possibly around the age of 16, was found trembling in fear in his tent. Upon being questioned, he said that five of the loggers had returned from the woods with eyes that seemed full of hate. They didn't act right, they seemed irrationally angry. He said they went insane and began to attack the other loggers, using their hands and axes. He ran hiding into his tent, only occasionally picking out to the outside. He claimed that it was at that moment when he saw the mist come from the woods and start surrounding the logging site, as if something was unleashing some unknown evil power through it. The entire operation was completely shut down after the incident. My great-great-granddad returned to his hometown and became a barber instead, and the indigenous tribe leader learned about the incident and was not surprised. The Japanese later had to request a shaman over to bless the entire logging site, and the paranormal activities were all gone after that. The surviving trees are still there in Nando County. They are now well protected by the National Forest Administration. I think if every tree has consciousness like these, it would definitely make mankind cherish our planet a bit more.